Good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's Dean's Research Seminar. Um, and today we have Professor Deli Chen with us. Um, I'll introduce Deli and uh, then he'll get going. So um, Deli Chen is a Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor of this university. He did his PhD in soil science here at Melbourne and now, many years later, is the leader of the Soil and Environment Research Group in the School of Agriculture and Food. He's also the faculty's China director and director of the Australia-China Joint Research Center for Healthy Soils for Sustainable Food Production and Environmental Quality. Following a recent grant success, well done, Delhi, uh, he is now also director of the new ARC Research Hub for Innovative Nitrogen Fertilizers and Inhibitors. Professor Chen is an internationally recognized soil scientist working on the efficiency of nitrogen use in agriculture systems and its impact on global food security and climate change. He has active international collaborations with um, scientists in China, uh, the US and Europe, and he works closely with industry partners. He has over 300 peer reviewed publications, including papers in Nature and PNAS, and his work has been recognized through national and international awards, including the Kingenta Agricultural Science Award and fellowships of the American Society of Agronomy, the Soil Science Society of America and the Soil Science Australia. His seminar today is entitled Reducing Nitrogen Losses for Sustainable Agriculture and the Environment. Um, Deli, welcome and over to you. Thank you, John. Well, I, uh, today I'm talking about the, the, the title is uh, Reducing Nitrogen Losses for Sustainable Agriculture. Actually, I have an um, interest on uh, nitrogen when I was year 10 student. Because that's when 1970, I think 72, around that time, uh, I was, uh, you look at the map, that's where I grew up. It's uh, 300 kilometers north of Shanghai. It's a uh, rice paddy and rice growing area. I remember when uh, the chemical fertilizer urea was introduced that time. I, and when I came back from school, back to home, I, I saw the fish died in the rice paddies. I was surprised, I know, but also I could see and the impact of the urea fertilizer after farmers sprayed, it, uh, the, the, the rice become greener, of course, higher yield. So I was puzzled why and uh, fish dies is always in my mind. So and I went to university, uh, mainly study chemistry, but soil chemistry in the in, in, uh, Nanjing Agricultural University. And, uh, and then a master degree in the Institute of Soil Science, Chinese Academy of Science, again on soil and nitrogen, and with in the passion I have. And then uh, I got a scholarship from Melbourne University, did my PhD here. And then uh, from 1994, my career to 2005, I was on soft money, level A to level C, the fellow in 2000, and converted teaching. In the, TNR in 2005 and they become Labour Yi, the first, uh, the first uh, million Chinese in Melbourne University. Again, research focus on nitrogen. So, actually, you know, so my, when a young boy, the puzzle interest uh, resolved when I was doing my PhD, which was uh, almost 28 years later, because why fish died when you apply urea fertilizer into the rice paddies. And urea is a hydrolyzed into ammonia, produce hydroxyl pH increase. Also, the nitrogen, the phosphorus in the rice paddies stimulate the algae glow. The algae actually will stimulate dissolved carbon dioxide in the, in the flood of water. Again, push pH up. You can see on the, on the table, on the figure, so the pH can, can go to as high as 9.5 in the midday, the diurnal circle, that's my, Part, part of my PhD published in 1997. So when the pH above, above pH at nine, 10% ammonia become ammonia gas. It's toxic to the fish. So that is uh, always uh, the puzzle me for from young, I think, the uh, solar science. Okay, the nitrogen, that's my talk today. So the reactive nitrogen, which is a chemical fertilizer, you know, uh, synthesized by, uh, invented by two chemical engineers and uh, in the BASF in Germany, 
actually in almost 105 years ago, 106 years ago, and the Herbert Bosch. So I actually was invited for the 100 year anniversary by BSF in Germany. I gave a talk. You know, we made a joke, you know, okay, yes, the chemical nitrogen, you know, responsible for, and uh, for half of the world population. If without a chemical nitrogen fertilizer, you will see this green line. That's what where the world population will be today. Will be half what we have now. So we made a joke. We so is this invention is good or bad? If uh, if we have half the population today, wouldn't be the Earth world more sustainable? So today, worldwide, produce about 130 million tons of nitrogen, chemical nitrogen fertilizer. You know, okay, it's a cost of hundreds, roughly 130 million dollars to the farmers. In Australia, we use probably after one half percent of the world. So we use 1.5 million tons. You know. But uh, so in Australia, so we, but per, per capita, anything per capita in Australia is high. Worldwide, per capita, nitrogen fertilizer used 15 kilos. China is very high, but Australia actually much higher. In the forest rate, anything per, per, per capita is high. So Australia used one half, one, one half million tons nitrogen fertilizer cost the farmers about two billion dollars a year. So you can see on the graph on the left, so from 1960 Green Revolution, which is a irrigation fertilizer new blade. You know, the global serious yield increased by three times. And uh, in parallel, the fertilizer irrigation phosphorus increase. And, but, but last 40 years, you can see this uh, on graph on the right bottom. Uh, it's per unit of fertilizer. The, food, the yield increase declined significantly. So basically, roof sum about half of the chemical nitrogen is lost to environment. Okay, 50% used by crops. But I, just for your information, okay, the, the animals nitrogen efficient even much lower. You look at the, the goat nitrogen cohesion rate from the dietary nitrogen into the meat, less than five, and the, and the beef is bad. And this is older data. Seven now now it's improved still around ten to twelve. And if you eat more pork, more chicken, more sustainable. So the animal nitrogen efficiency is much lower than the crop. So the impact, okay, we know the chemical nitrogen fertilizer helped the food production, food security for half of the population, but the impact to the environment also big. So my own personal experience, when I was a young boy, I can swim in the water, lots of river, I can drink the water when I'm swimming. This is when I go to my hometown, let alone I can drink the water in the river, I even can't swim, the polluted green algae grow, less, less expensive environment. So as Peter said, you know, the human being manipulation of the nitrogen cycling are essential for our well-being, but it's substantial cost for global change. So in fact, um, the reactive nitrogen is already exceeded the safe boundary of the nature. And, uh, Six years ago, European, European Union did a compre comprehensive, spent 24 million euro to do the comprehensive nitrogen assessment. You know, the conclusion published in Nature by Mark Sutton, you know, the cost, the health cost, the cost to the reactive nitrogen in the European Union alone is 70 to 320 billion euro per year. It's a, of course, it's large, uncertain, large uh, certainty. That's why big range, 70, even 70 is a huge. If you believe this thing, publishing nature, and in fact, it's a benefit is far greater than the agriculture production in Europe. And uh, just on that, I also was an advisor on China uh, agriculture pollution, you know, for Lake Tai. It's a big lake near Shanghai, Jiangsu, and uh, Zhejiang province is uh, 2,000 square kilometers. And 
China, last 20 years, Chinese government spent 300 billion yuan trying to reduce pollution for Lake Tai, but not a very effective. And, uh, and also for Australia, you know, we know, you know, the agriculture pollution, the nutrient loading to the Great Reef, nitrogen phosphorus is huge. Okay, how nitrogen is lost from soil? This is a simple, probably for someone, for, for maybe for others, complex diagram. That's how the nitrogen is lost from soil, you know, by, by physical chemical processes, ammonia fertilization, ammonium become ammonia through away to the air, or ammonium will become an uh, oxidized nitrate leached with water, you know, to the groundwater, to the you know, surface runoff, or chemically, biochemically, denitrate reduced to into a potent greenhouse gas, 300 times worse than carbon dioxide, and uh, into a further reduced into. So this, um, where does ammonia come from? Either from soil organic matter or chemical fertilizer or animal waste. The water is a key driver for the processes. So my, car oh, geez, my uh, career, research career, this is an uh, agency, geez. and I uh, started from really much the, the studying the processes of the fundamental nitrogen cycle in the soil, start from measurement. So I still remember when when I when I uh, when we won a large CSR cluster project, the missing cluster project. You know our our argument rationale: if you can't measure, you can't mitigate. So so my my career research started from the measurement, studying fundamental processes. You know, used with including stable isotope N15 as a tracer, and also later on. With molecular biotech, with Taiwan uh, and the gym so help. Look for this one. It's a Argent's PhD. We do, it's part of our work in the Myanmar. Look, we look at uh, all of the fundamental the natural, natural conserving processes, DNI, dissemination of natural reduction to ammonium, and uh, NMOX denitrification. Really complex. You say, okay, the isotope. 15, oxygen 18, and uh, molecular, molecular biotech. And then, of course, we also do some uh, in situ real life measurement in the field. Soil sampling, dig up soil, look at major soil back density, Helen and Raymond and other students. Uh, soil solution sampling, you know, the, we're doing the micro plot in the Myanmar. So, we do the really digging the soil with shovel. And of course, and for greenhouse gas, that's uh, one of my major focus in the last 10, 15 years of my research career because the greenhouse gas is always fashionable, is important, and we have lots of funding available. So we started major N2O, uh, National Oxide, you know, funded by SCR, you know, with a chamber, automatic chamber, the chamber as high as two meters of the maze. And then later on, we using far more fancy instrument Open pass technology, open pass laser, open pass FTIR, with uh, which measures line average concentration of the gases, ammonia, uh, nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, or nitrogen gases, other greenhouse gases, methane, carbon dioxide as well. And then we use the atmospheric dispersion model to calculate the fluxes. It's a uh, latest technology. And uh, some action photos we did with open pass laser, FTIR. Uh, some ammonia sampler, and uh, early days we use even use the acid trap to to measure and uh, ammonia concentration in the air. And then uh, the we uh, through ARC uh, leaf ground and also cluster project we have acquired half a million dollars, three or four hundred million dollars field equipment, including is uh, the most uh, sensitive. Uh, it, and the quantum cascade laser, so which is can measure is a fast response can measure the con concentration more than ten times per second, ten hertz, which is required. This is the speed required if we're going to use any equivalence to calculate fluxes. So we have four units of those, and then 
So this is just show you the toy instrument we have. We, if we're not a modest, we, we argue a bit, we probably the, has the best expertise or equipment in the world in, in terms of greenhouse gases, uh, natural gases measurement, you know, from FTIR laser to quantum cascade laser. For quantum cascade laser, you'll be amazed the precision for, for ammonia, the 30 PPT, 30 parts per trillion, not billion, and the 10 hertz for such a lower for N2O and the methane still 50 parts per trillion. So we, so such high, high sensitivity precision, we, we, we integrate to the, to the aircraft. The air, this aircraft is from and uh, Flinders University, it's a low speed, low height aircraft. We, we try to get our quantum cast laser to be installed into a powerless aircraft. And uh, therefore we can do a large regional scale nitrogen gases, greenhouse gas measurement. This is a, uh, this project was, in that time was, was, was supported by $3 million CSR cluster project. And then we measure, in a feedlot greenhouse gas emission in the north and the south, Charlton. And basically, basically, we use a different type of instrument method. One of the methods that we use aircraft, we treated the, the four, four square kilometers feedlot at Charlton, 20,000 20, cattle as a big chamber in the use of mass balance. So you can see when we fly. 18 meters, we can detect 220 ppb ammonia, but at 310 meters, we still can, we are still able to measure 40 ppb. And then this is different heights, and then we fly a distance from 0.5 to 6 kilometers away from feedlot. We're still able to measure this concentration, and then we catch the fluxes. This measurement is important to study fundamental processes, but its measurement alone adequate. The measurement is very expensive and uh, like uh, it's an airborne measurement, it, it costs more than $10,000 per day and uh, even for chambers measurement it will cost a quarter million dollars per year to do that. And then even you, even you can afford, you only measure really specific the paddocks under specific climate, soil, land use conditions. But if, you know, it's impossible Without the measurement, we can we can scaling up for national greenhouse gas inventory or large scale natural losses. So, uh, not only expensive, just impossible. So we and also for like uh, management to greenhouse gas like a nitrous oxide N2O. You know, N2O is a potent greenhouse gas, contributes six percent of Australian greenhouse gas, but it only account for one percent of natural dynamics. So really to, uh, to mitigate, to develop uh, this uh, nitrogen management, to, to mitigate greenhouse gas emission, we have to really take a system approach. So the pro therefore, the process-based agroecosystem model is a decision support to us, very useful. So that's show you an example. One of my PhD students, we did, we have, we have 100 micro plots uh, to measure Greenhouse gases at a chiabulum elevated pasture. And uh, you can see the variation is from 20 to 750, depending where, to, where do you put your chambers. And that uh, can be 40 times 40 time difference. And then we run, you know, at uh, Rosiglin, we, we run our model with our measurement. You can see that the N2 emissions from weight, from weight. If you, if we measure two years, 1970, or measure three years in 2000, the flux can be three times different. The how long you're going to measure, and as I said earlier, it's expensive to measure. So we so we develop this um, uh, GIS-based special reference agro and you know, water nutrient management model, and uh, like other agro ecosystem model, then simulate and uh, water nutrient dynamics plant growth, have a nitrogen cycling. So therefore, we can apply this model, for example, at the irrigated pasture, you know, we, we are, the model should be able 
to simulate the soil water dynamics, soil temperature, and then and the mineral nitrogen layer for greenhouse gases. This model, this model has been used by Stanford University in Mexico. And then the, and then now also this model you see China Asia project, like the current Asia project in Myanmar, with used them project this model develop uh, and a smartphone based federal decision support tool. So because smartphone is geographically referenced, where do you work to? Like if if there is one, can connect a soil digital map, soil property, climate information, and your experimental data, therefore, in a, a scenario analysis, come up with economic consideration, come up with decision support to it. Just like uh, we use our Apple, like use our mobile phone to check the weather. That's what we're aiming for. So this is the model. However, when, when our project in China, you know, our decision support system, our experiment, you know, demonstrate can reduce the fertilizer more than 20% without we had any impact on the yield. You know, farmers benefited as well. And that latter area, uh, region, demonstration area, you know, would achieve $200 million per year benefit. But the adoption outside demonstration size, very really little. So, and like really from science to action, we need not only need the, the science solution, economic sustainable, we need a policy to do that. The other way to enhance nitrogen efficiency, reduce losses, is enhanced efficient fertilizer. Our group has been working with insect pivot for the last 15 years. We use the urea inhibitor to reduce ammonia volatilization, nitrification inhibitor to reduce leaching, denitrification into emission, Control release can reduce all the losses. Only this, we basically, our soil group, we very much evaluation products and in the field, in the laboratory. And uh, you can see the DMPP nitrification inhibitor can reduce the into losses by more than 40%, can reduce the ammonia losses by, by, by 80%. However, there are only a few commercial chemicals available, they are inconsistent, sometimes effective, in some soils are not effective because those chemicals are produced and developed in the North Hemisphere, sometimes it's not suitable for Australian environment. So it's pretty exciting, you know, we are developing, we have two really large projects at the moment under successful, awarded and under contract. One is with GRDC, $5 million, and the ARC hub, another $5 million from ARC, if including industry, university co-investment, these two projects will be more than $20 million. We focused on it and, uh, to develop the next generation nitrogen fertilizer, the inhibitors, the smart coating. You know, we, we have team together for, later from our, our faculty uh, with, the, with the chemistry and the chemical engineering. And uh, from, we try to, from more pure level, to design new effective inhibitors. And then can we link urease inhibitor, nitrogen inhibitor together? And then can we use the, the advanced the pharmaceutical coating technology into the fertilizer? And then the fertilizer can respond to the soil, soil properties and then plant nutrient stress signals. So I want to give you all the details. This and the hub. This is a, the slides from Ultra Willy from Bio 21 Chemistry. That's how we developing. We already have a provision pattern to developing uh, to de develop the, and uh, promising natural inhibitor. Now we're going to use the inhibitor. Eventually we're going to link them together. This is the slides from uh, Kathleen, from Kate, from engineering, and the, uh, the marble co uh, coating, effective coating. And this is from Frank Caruso. And uh, this is a uh, uh, MPN smart coating, and uh, this is uh, uh, the focus of uh, our new ARC hub. Okay, the other way to reduce nitrogen losses is if we can capture 
the nitrogen lost from intensive livestock system. The worldwide, as I said earlier, we produce roughly at the moment about 130 million tons of chemical nitrogen fertilizer per year. And uh, the livestock actually excrete nitrogen, the manure, is almost, it's about 100 million tons. More than 70% of this animal waste nitrogen is lost from the environment, environment pollution. You know, we all, we all know all the intensive livestock system is a hot spot in one pollution. You look at the piggery, the poetry, feedlot. So if we are able to capture this nitrogen, so we, we effectively we can reduce the chemical nitrogen fertilizer by more than 50%. So this is uh, what uh, we, are, we are going to do, we are doing already. It's uh, the new CRC, CRCP, CRC project was funded. Well, reminding me of the uh, hope get a contract signed this week, next week. It's, it's a large project, you know, we have uh, and, uh, more than $4 million cash. Uh, and uh, with uh, Australia fresh milk holding, the largest uh, intensive dairy in Australia, with MLA Dairy Australia funding. Basically, this project, we're going to use a lignite, which is, which is uh, abundant in Victoria, and, and the modified lignite, modified black coal, to mitigate reactive nitrogen losses, and then convert livestock waste to, to the nutrient, nutrient, nutrient rich manure or biofertilizer, which are more effective soil amendments. For example, the work we did, funded by MLA, MLA we spray lignite, brown coal, in a feedlot animal pens, we can reduce ammonia losses by, by 60 to 70%. For 20,000, just for your information, for 20,000 cattle in Charlton, Victoria, which is the average size fit lot, every day ammonia losses is equivalent to nine tons urea fertilizer. Okay, and that's 3,000 tons urea per year, which is worth a million dollars. So if we spray lignite, we can reduce the nitrogen ammonia losses from 170, 155 to 52. So this is a, so the cattle intake 300 gram nitrogen per day, which is roughly three kilogram pollutant. Pollutant, 70 percent loss of ammonia. Now if we use the lignite, we can reduce. And then the manure, cattle manure become nutrient rich through through this fertilizer. And then we we did experiment in the turkey growing sorghum. The sorghum biomass yield increased by. 40%. But we are conscious that lignite not everywhere is available, high water contained, expensive transport. So we, we are working on can we dewater modify lignite without losing the effectiveness? Or can we activate black coal to become more effective? So very promising by, by, by being way Clayton, few people with working together. So this already have a, we already filed a provision patent already. So it's a very promising, the modified black coal, even just as effective as lignite. Okay, I'm talking about the measurement and the modeling and uh, uh, livestock mitigation, livestock uh, natural losses. Well, last few years, our team, my team, you know, we, uh, we joined fashion. Wagon is a big data, data analytic, data analytical, nitrogen footprint, greenhouse gas in, uh, green indexes. So it's not just for fashion, but it's very important. So worldwide, everyone wants agriculture to be sustainable, efficient. But yet, worldwide, when you walk in the supermarket, there's, there's no, there's, you, you can't tell the beef from Australia, beef from US. Which one is greener? You know, we have, you know, you have a supermarket, you have a corner organic food, and uh, they charge a premium price, but there's no scientific evidence organic food is more sustainable. So, Australia will claim green and a clean agricultural products. Clean, yes, no contamination, safe to eat. Green, nobody can tell you what green means. It's very much, very much marketing, marketing slogans. 
uh, this is something we and uh, we are part of an international consortium to develop evidence-based sustainable indexes for agricultural products. We start from nitrogen indexes, and uh, and then we, you know, really we can substantiate Australian claimed green. And, uh, but more importantly, and then we we hope we will have a labeling for food, and you can compare. And then with, with the evidence this indexes, and then we can cap the environmental cost. And then, and then we want to, we, not for any seconds, we want to punish the farmers. But on, on, on the other hand, you know, if we can cap the societal cost of the uh, agricultural products, and then as consumer or city people, we should really should pay for that. Because the food, as I said, uh, you know, I read somewhere in 1950 in Australia, and the household spent thirty percent income on food. Now seven percent, we pay too little for food, and then should should not we pay for the environmental cost of the food? And then if China, Japan import Australian food, should they pay for the, the environmental cost? And this is the work, you know, I I will invite the give a talk in the Nazi the fertilizer workshop last year last year I will talk about this and uh, natural credit and also environment based indexes you know we all know this day if you have buy a car car has a tear manufacturer has to tell you how much carbon dioxide produces per kilometer you know you buy a washing machine energy stuff for food we don't have so this is something we will develop we we have applied ERC discovery, we're not sure we're going to get it. And uh, evidence-based indexes, you know, of course, we need to look at the whole supply chain. We need the measurement. We need to field monitoring you know, and the modeling. Therefore, we are able to calculate, develop evidence-based natural indexes. With the indexes, we can, we can, we try to influence the policy, natural credit. You know, rather than you pay like China $300 billion yuan to clean up that tape, that's effective. The government should, sub, should provide incentive to pay for the good, more effective products, more efficient uh, practices. And then when we have the indexes, we should have food labeling. We can influence the consumers. The consumers say, ah, this, this is the vegetable, this is the meat, has a lower nitrogen footprint. It must be good for the environment, and I, 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 will, I would rather buy this one, or eventually and charge premium prices. And uh, here my calculator for me. We can uh, compare, you know, per kilogram, wheat flour produced in China, 1.1 grams nitrogen oxide. Australia, 0.2. We are much green. Same as vegetable. Okay, so if we can have a like a five star energy star. Like for natural stuff, and eventually if we can convince the food producer to have label, and then and then if like uh, the work with Helen and Rima we did in a vegetable farm, if we use the nitrification capital DMPP, see the greenhouse gas emission per kilo per kilogram is much lower. So and then we can you know that's really that's encouragement for people use in high. Natural inhibitor. Okay, if we use a, if we use a lignite for feedlot per kilogram, ammonia losses per kilogram beef is reduced from 160 to 48. Much significant progress, uh, reduction. Okay, this is okay. Well, if we have a, and then it's a natural footprint. Another area our our team uh, working on this area. This is okay. What as a, our individual, our consumption choice have impact on reactive nitrogen. So this is a reactive nitrogen footprint initially we developed by uh, and, uh, Tim Galloway from you know, uh, from, uh, uh, from US, and uh, we we part of our consortium now. So it's really the metric total amount of reactive nitrogen the lost to environment directly indirectly due to the individual consumption of the full energy. So. We did, a, uh, we did a pioneering work for Australia national footprint. We are embarrassing. Australia is by half per capita. 
is a nothing problem. And that because we consume, because large proportion, because the food, and then energy. Because in Australia, per average, we actually per, we consume more beef than Americans. Our Australia have a have big house, inefficient house, and our electricity come from 70% from coal. Coal has a very not high natural footprint. That's why the energy contribution is big too, compared to other countries. So when we publish the paper, and the MLA is pretty not happy. Oh, the beef, you blame beef for the large, large natural footprint. We publish another paper. Okay, okay, what about, uh, this is a per capita, per person, our conscience. This is a per unit area, reactive nitrogen loading. Now we are very good, Australia, much greener, except a few hot spots, sugar cane, in a fiddle-up in a city, this Australia, compared to Japan, compared to New Zealand, we are much greener. We published it in a, a good journal, and uh, I, I send this paper to MLA as well. I say, this is good, 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 we, we are greener. So the challenge, okay, I think I'll talk about, I'll skip that. Okay, when we have this uh, societal cost, and then we will have to look at Australia, you know, we are aiming to have $100 billion agriculture export in 25 years. This is the annual, we actually export 1.6 million tons pure nitrogen through food export. Okay, domestic consumption 1.2 million tons. Yes, we make a, we make, we are making lots of money. It's very important for Australian economy. But what is the society environment cost to Australia? This I can show you this slide from Remo. You know, also it's, this this uh, proposal is uh, with ARC discovery as well. In some industry for for dairy, we use excessive nitrogen for sugar cane. We pollute our environment. So the natural input, natural removal from products is an input much higher because the natural cost for those intensive agriculture, like vegetable, dairy, sugar cane, fill out the cost is a very small fraction cost. Farmer use far lot. But in contrast, for Australian dry land grain industry, we use too little. You know, the natural removal by far higher the nitrogen input. We actually mining soil fertility, therefore organic matter. So let's see why our dry land organic matter declining because we are mining our soil nitrogen. So how long, what is this in the global export, agriculture export cost to the, to the environment pollution intensive or sustainability cost to the grain industry? This is, some, this, is, this is another area of research we're doing. So, okay, then I will finish it with the nitrogen critter ideas. This, this paper will be submitted a science policy forum. I'm not sure if it's accepted or not. We, 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 we developed the concept. Okay, we should have a rather government pay, like China's government, 300 million to clean Thai Lake. Or Australian government spend a $500 million with a controversial to reduce nutrient load for sugar cane to get rid of the reef. Why don't we release money to fund to prevention, the cause of pollution and prevention to, to support the better products, better practices? Well, in the end, we need money. That's what where your money come from, come from tax, come from like environment tax for food or government pollution target. And then we, we the money, this is, I don't want to go detail, this, this is our proposal. And then to farmers. So, because we know the prevention is 50 to 100 times more effective than the cleanup mitigation. But this is, this was my, uh, when I promoted the full professor 10 years ago, I give a public lecture, I, I finish with this slide. You know, this is nothing to do with my science, research in soil science. The most effective ways to reduce reactive nitrogen losses, it's a, it's a population control. If we have less people, 
less consumption, less fertilizer. I'll give you an example where, where I come from China. If China in 1972, which is the family planning policy, if, we did, if China didn't have that policy, China today will have 400 million more people, another USA. Thank you. Okay, the acknowledgement, I can achieve all this with my uh, mentor, colleagues, students, and, uh, and uh, international collaborators, uh, fundings, and uh, funding bodies. And uh, Max uh, Porter asked me to show this slide, this slide as a final slide. Thank you. Thank you, Delhi. Um, that tour de force about nitrogen. Um, now, um, we can take questions. You're happy to take questions, I hope. Yes. Um, and so can I ask people to put them in the uh, Q&A box, which is on the bottom of your um, Zoom screen, and uh, put them in the Q&A box and not the chat box, please. Um, I can see uh, a few chats there, but um, we want them in the Q&A box. And what we can do is when they're in the Q&A box, uh, I can ask you to, um, to uh, pose your question live. And if not, uh, if you don't open your microphone, then um, I will just read out the questions. So, um, Tim Reeves, uh, maybe we can start with you. And you had a couple of uh, questions I noticed. Um, Tim, are you there? Yes, I am, John. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. Very good. Uh, Delhi, uh, great um, uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of comments first. One is I'm really interested in your comments about utilizing livestock waste and development of biofertilizers. Um, I reviewed Horizon 2020 projects for the European Commission this year um, on sustainable intensification in Africa and more circular regional economies based on bio-based inputs were one of the, the key target areas there. And... Um, I noticed close to the home sustainability, Victoria, their strategy, their new strategy is around recycling and uh, perhaps that could, could fit in with it. My question is, um, as you're aware, you know, we're submitting various proposals to establish a sustainable agricultural intensification research platform at Dookie based on four um, different farming systems. And and we want to measure you know, all of the inputs, outputs, losses, energy fluxes between those farming systems. And I'm wondering which of the technologies that you described in your talk will be most relevant to this uh, proposed um, sustainable agricultural intensification research platform. Thanks, Tim. Well, Tim, and uh, we've been working, you know, I think that this circular economy, how to recycle and reuse organic waste is very important. And uh, but try, trying to have zero fertilizer increase, and uh, they also emphasize that the technology use, and uh, we try different sort. You know, like uh, we believe that's how we we could success for large CRC project is use a lignite. The lignite is uh, we're lucky. To, the lignite has everything we need uh, to meet to capture the nitrogen from livestock waste. It's acidic, it's a higher cation exchange capacity, it's a levi carbon to immobilize the nitrogen. And then, and, uh, and then the manure will become nitrogen rich manure. And then slowly this fertilizer as well. And then you can apply into the agriculture soil. In particular, for Australian soil, we have, we have sometimes we have soil, subsoil constraint, acidity, and the toxicity. So it will be a very effective uh, soil amendment. And uh, not only the nitrogen nutrient, but improve soil property, therefore enhance the biomass production, therefore sequester more carbon. So I think uh, this and uh, uh, that is uh, the, the focus of our CRCP and lignite. Of course, I'm also aware of uh, biochar, uh, other technology, some other soil, some other amendments. People use acid, you know, because if you if the order of manure is alkaline, the main parts where the manure and nitrogen losses are ammonia. If we can reduce pH, we'll reduce the nitrogen losses. But uh, you apply acid it can be expensive unless you have uh, industrial waste. So I say it's a lignite modified black coal, very promising. 
team. Thanks, Dolly. Um, I had a question which was um, went back to where you started your talk and you were saying that when people put nitrogen fertilizers on the soil and you got run off into the rivers, all the fish were dying. And um, of course, we're all aware, and you mentioned it, of the runoff into, uh, along the rivers and into, onto the Great Barrier Reef. Um, do you see other ways that people are actually mitigating these problems? Or is the, um, is the only way to do it to put on less nitrogen fertilizer or to capture it in the way you're talking about capturing it on coal? I mean, what, what are the ways that people are dealing with this problem? Okay, John, and um, yes, let's talk, let's uh, what are we working on is smart fertilizer. Okay, well, I need to clarify when I said a fish die, actually a fish die on the, on the uh, rice paddies. Because the rice paddy, you know, when I, when I was growing up, as a prominent fly, lots of fish. When I was young, I would catch lots of fish. And in the, in the, in the, in the, when into the river, prominent fish would not die, it was diluted but in the rice paddies because of ammonia toxicity. The other way, okay, yes, we, we can reduce the fertilizer and nitrogen, but uh, Okay, this um, uh, when urea hydrolyzes into ammonia, it's very really rapid by urea as the enzyme. If we can slow down these processes, either use urea as inhibitor or control release. If the fertilizer only can release the amount when the crop needed, crop needs, and then we wouldn't have this problem. So this this is one of the, John is uh, one of our the new ARC hub, and uh, we focus on. Working with uh, the control release, we work as I said, working with uh, the chemical engineering group, and can we develop a cost cost effective and uh, coatings that can release and uh, responding to the soil environment or plant conditions. So, or urea inhibitor. Yes, we we can uh, we can there is an alternative way through that. Thanks, Dilly. Um, here's a question that's a little bit different. Laura Horton, are you online? Um, yes, I am. And I'm sorry to ask a question that's completely off topic. It's only because I've recently, um, I've had some bad news regarding um, a friend of mine who's been recently diagnosed with minor neuron disease. And I've been doing my own research and into fer the connection between fertilizers and um, minor neuron disease. But this is very off topic, so I don't expect um, there to be a, uh, <laughs> this to be the pr appropriate forum to ask it, but I was just wondering if you happen to have any anecdotal or other um, knowledge on the, the connection. So what a disease, I'm not clear. Oh, um, it's, it's motor neuron disease or otherwise known as, I don't even know how to Amyotrophic, I'll, I'll help you here, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, so it's a rare, it's a rare neurological disease, Delian. It has been associated with um, nitrogen fertilizers, but um, you know, perhaps, perhaps a bit off topic. But uh, yes, for this, maybe John um, can help, John can help him help him answer this question. No, I can't answer this. <laughs> no problem. Thank you anyway. <laughs> All right, Laura. Thanks for asking. Um, okay, um, Richard, did you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, John. Um, Delhi, hi. Uh, <clears throat> I remember uh, one of our leading um, predecessors um, uh, giving a retirement seminar, John Freeney, um, and he'd spent his entire life studying various inhibition processes, inhibiting ammonia, inhibiting um, nitrification. And he kind of concluded in his seminar that the nitrogen cycle is slippery, and if you block one process, you merely stimulate another, and the net loss remains about constant. It seemed a very defeatist way to uh, for your retirement seminar. But what do you think of that? I mean, that, you know John pretty well. Yeah, of course. And, it's John, and, John, yes, I'm not very aware of that. Really, 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 really. That we can spend our careers blocking processes and merely stimulating another. Hey, uh, Richard, I'm really aware of that. You know, uh, John Freeney was uh, my PhD supervisor. <laughs> So I worked with him for a long time. Now, I think when he gave that talk, that was uh, this. Yes, I'm really concerned for that. You know, if you uh, reduce ammonia losses and more nitrogen can be nitrified, and then and then denitrified losses, then that was the evidence. He wrote a review on his his research published worldwide. But uh, this is different. If we okay, okay, because if you 
if we develop control release fertilizer, we only release fertil and uh, how much nitrogen plant needed. And then, you know, what he described wouldn't happen. Okay, this is one way. Secondly, you know, uh, in that time, you know, when John Fellini retired, nitrogen, nitrogen inhibitor, urease inhibitor was probably, was early days. This said we can produce far more effective. And also with that, and then, when the one of the you know, could be uh, John's assumption is you still, if you apply the same quantity, if you control one pathway losses, you, you will enhance the other pathway losses. But uh, our objective, if we can reduce the losses, therefore we should apply, apply less. Um, Dolly, can I ask you another question about the um, nitrogen consumption in Australia? You said that um, in Australia it was it was essentially the well of the countries you showed it was the highest per capita yes. use of nitrogen. Yes. And um, if when I looked up when I was looking at those uh, graphs, I think um, the the lower part of the graph was about agricultural production, and some of it was about energy production. And you talked about the fact that we burn a lot of coal, and that that. Okay. Um, that there's quite polluting of nitrogen amongst other things. Hmm. Um, but if I just go to the agricultural production for a moment, what, why is Australia so high in its use of nitrogen in agricultural production? Is that just because the soils are so poor in Australia and they need a lot of nitrogen? Or is that because the farmers here are quite rich and throw a lot of nitrogen on very large paddocks? John, and uh, when, when per capita, it's the way they use a lot, but per unit of land, we use very little much lower than wood, wood average. So, as I said, uh, yes, in Australia, we have really contrasting systems. As I said, uh, you know, for intensive agricultural, uh, like vegetable, dairy, sugarcane, we use too much. Yes, we have money, we, a farmer has money because the fertilizer cost is only 10% or 20% maximum of the operating cost. So they just uh, the labor cost and machinery cost like vegetable, much, much higher. Australian vegetable farm is among the lowest efficient farmers in the world. And uh, yes, we have problem because when farmers make decision, fill out decision, we're talking about, you know, and how decision support all stuff. But uh, John, for the last uh, 70 or 100 years, farmers, we, when it's sort of equity business economics, we're still only talking about, you know, the fertilizer input cost and the green farm get income. The, the suicide cost of pollution or, or, or mining soil organic matter, this sustainability cost, suicide cost, never be included in farm decision making. I don't blame farmers because they don't need to. This is a problem, you know, like, uh, you know, for example, okay, one extent we're polluting environment, another extent for Australian wheat farmers, the exploitation of soil fertility. How long can they keep doing that? 50 years? Organic matter declining? And be, because they they farming 5,000 hectares, really input of fertilizer, only 40 kilogram, 50 kilogram, because they are after profit. So that is uh, the dilemma, because we as society worldwide, we do not and, uh, give a real dollar to the, this societal cost of nitrogen. That's what uh, um, you know, our research, which have develop a framework to calculate actual societal cost. And then this, co this cost either should be passed to consumers and back to the farmers. Thanks, Tony. I suppose thinking about it as well, if it's per capita, um, in Australia, we're efficient at food production and we export about two thirds of it or something like Correct. that, don't we? So actually per capita of population, we're producing a lot of, a lot of food and that's pr probably why our nitrogen use is high. Correct, John. We, we, we export food, Okay, and uh, we but at expenses, either polluting environment, dairy, vegetable, sugarcane, polluting environment, or mining our soil fertility. Lots of yep. expenses. Let's move to your food labeling, and uh, Anita Lawrence has a question for you. Anita. Hello. Um, I was I, I was really interested. Um, in the food labeling um, that you were talking about at the end. And I was just wondering if there's any initiatives in other countries to put labels on the nitrogen pollution associated with different foods. And secondly, also, um, if you are 
planning on um, developing a label or some sort of symbol or um, logo for Australia. I was wondering if you've talked to Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, because they're the people who regulate food labels, as I'm sure you're aware. Thanks, yes. And uh, very much at this stage, you know, there's some anecdotal research, some in the US label, you know, and uh, Australian, I'm not sure now, but uh, and it, uh, until we have, let's say, the societal uh, cost in one of the credit, you can see the benefit for the labels. But we will not do that. It costs extra to do that. And also the label and uh, require evidence, which, you know, because we can't put, oh, it's organic food. That's really vague. What is organic food? And uh, because in uh, uh, you know, order of organic food, if you apply too much organic manure, it's equally bad. But the manure will be and, uh, in the mineralized into inorganic, equally environmental pollutant. So but it, when we're talking about labeling, we need a scientific evidence based. So let's require lots of study measurement. And then not less expensive, not easy. And then, as I said, if we come in uh, as society and uh, we have, we will pay for that credit. And then that will be, will be the uh, encouragement for food labeling. Of course, we're not rule out some progressive farmers and industries. For example, you know, we try to work with uh, China feedlot is produced Angus beef in the high quality. If we, if they can use a lignite for the how and, uh, and uh, feedlot because they have big enough, can we, in, in, uh, can we encourage them for the national footprint? And then of course you have to talk to cows, well worse, there's those certain food chain as well. So it's quite complex. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Deli. And Anita, thanks for the question. Sarah, do you want to, Sarah Q, do you want to ask your question or would you like me to read it out? Um, if you come on live, then you can ask, you can, um, ask it. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, uh, I was just wondering if you would be able to um, expand on the point. Uh, this is sort of adding to Anita's question, I guess. Um, but how might you be able to use um, big data to actually drive the nitrogen rating initiative? Okay, well, I uh, um, the big data is uh, is important because we know how expensive to do all the measurement. You know, we have so much measurement in the past, so that's what uh, our team, uh, Memo and uh, Emma, a few people are doing that. Blah, blah. And uh, so we, the, the reason is big data. We're not just for fashionable because we can combine with more than machine learning to develop indexes, and then. Is, uh, the, the index is supported by evidence. So that's what the big data for. And then and, uh, we really, and uh, this big data, this is uh, the technical, technical work, technical pathway. And then we have to working with a resource economist. Is uh, what is societal cost, the real cost of environment. As I said, you know, we, how can we convert dollar value, you know, mining, soil, organic matter, initial value. And then I uh, wish be more expensive. And then when I when I give a talk in Japan, the first national footprint you know, in Japan, I made I repeated, I said it a few occasions, I made a joke. I said, look at your Japan, you know, water is clean, air clear, because 65% of your food is imported. You left environment damage footprint in Australia. Should you pay for that? You know, this is a required international you know, effort. They are stunned. They said, well, this is a reasonable question, but how do we pay for it? How much is it a fair value? That's what we need to work out. Yeah. Um, Dolly, can I um, read a, um, a question out from Lindsay Falvey, who had to go? Um, he, he was picking up on, you were talking about the Harbour Bosch uh, process for, um, for uh, getting nitrogen and saying that that had helped increase the world's population. Most of, which, most of that population increases in the poor countries. And, and Lindsay's point is that malnutrition is prevalent in those regions, particularly through the lack of micro, micronutrients such as choline, vitamins A and B12 um, that are available in these regions, but only from animals. And um, so he's saying, do you think that it's good use of um, nitrogen uh, for um, uh, producing livestock in these regions so that people can get the, um, the nutrients that they need? Um, what's what's your views on that? Because animals get a big, uh, a bad rap all the time as um, 
being producers of uh, nitrogen and uh, methane. And uh, so, you know, here in this case, though, in certain parts of the world, you actually need the animals for certain key micronutrients. This is oh, a good uh, nitrogen. Yeah. I think Lindsay is expert, and I agree. And if the macronutrient and it's a, it's a problem, and and which it only can come from the livestock, yes, yes, that's a good approach. And we can use a fertilizer, uh, maybe fertilizer to increase the the biomass, the animal feed, therefore, and then can support uh, support the animal production. But um, and I think that the population, yes, I agree with Lindsay. The population population increase in a we we estimate the next two billion population increase in the world will be mainly Africa, some poor country in Asia. You know, and uh, I always say, you know, and listen to my my research. You know, if the developed country, the foreign aid, not a, not a, the technology, but if we somehow can develop, I still remember the Copenhagen uh, meeting and uh, and the developing country asked. Uh, 100 billion US dollars per year for fully technical transfer to developing country and for mitigate greenhouse gas emission. I said that if 100 billion US dollars per year, those poor people have more social security, they don't have to have more children. That's far more effective. But for okay. population, population control, <laughs> that's more political. Um, all right, um, back to um, uh, Tim Reeves, are you still there? Would you like to, um, do you have a question about um, perhaps biological fixation of nitrogen versus putting on nitrogen onto uh, using fertilizers. Tim, do you want to raise that issue or maybe I will? Okay, I, I can, well, the biological nitrogen fixation still play a really important role. I think, uh, yes, in the, in the early days in Australia, you know, like Australia only used the nitrogen fertilizer. Hello very much uh, rely on the rotation, biological nitrogen fixation, legume, I think it's a very sustainable way. But the problem is that in the farmer, you know, it's uh, when it, when it buy, when a natural food it becomes relatively cheap, affordable, they do weight to weight, you know, they, they doing that because for short term, they're more profitable. That's why they do it. Long term, if they, if they, you know, mining soil of organic matter, they will not become sustainable. So mm. short term, yes, I think it's a problem. I will support, yes, if uh, I think uh, in a Doki platform, if we're going to have that uh, research proposed by David Gaddy and the team, and uh, Helen, I think uh, we, we, we should have started the integration of the you know, cropping system, in intercropping animal integration. I think it's a good idea. All right, Dali, I think we'll probably stop here because we're, um, we're uh, one hour and five minutes and uh, uh, you, there may be other questions, but people can email them to you. Um, thanks very much for a, a, a great oversight about um, how the nitrogen cycle works and its uh, problems and the, uh, the proposed solutions about how we might uh, um, actually deal with the problems around nitrogen by capturing it and making sure it doesn't um, run off to the same level or breaking down the products or having uh, um, labeling of the food that we eat so that we know how much it's uh, is being used. Um, it's a big area and an important one um, and it's great to have um, a world expert in the faculty. So um, thank you for that Delhi and um, with that we will we will sign off. Thank you all for thank being you. Thank you John, thank you all.